I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Matthew, chapter 16. Matthew 16, and I'm going to begin with verse 13. Matthew 16, and let's begin there with verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. I'm going to stop right there for a little while. Uh, a real Bible believer believes in comparing Scripture with Scripture, letting the Scriptures interpret themselves. The Bible says it should be precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, Jer uh, Isaiah 28 verse 10. The Apostle Paul describes it as comparing spiritual things with spiritual, 1 Corinthians 2 13, and that um, the ultimate teacher of the Christian is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God. Um, a Bible corrector or some Bible skeptic, someone who doesn't believe there is such a thing as a Bible you can have 100% uh, confidence in. Excuse me. Uh, he reads a single verse, and then he says, now what does that mean? He starts to imagine what he thinks it should mean, rather than comparing Scripture to Scripture. Southern Baptists are great for doing that. Southern Baptists, uh, when I was in uh, Pensacola Bible Institute, all of us guys in our class took a trip up to North Carolina, to Brother Wheeler's former church where he had grown up, and he had about you know, 12, 13 guys visiting on a Sunday morning. It's unusual for a church. So we sat in their adult Sunday school class, and the teacher uh, read a certain text, and he said, let's go around the room and everyone tell me what you think uh, it means to you or how does it minister to you. They did exactly what uh, we had been told they do. That's how they study the Bible by letting everybody just pitch in and say what the first thing that comes to their mind rather than comparing scripture with scripture to uh, uh, glean the right interpretation. But for a little while, um, I want to say, let's consider the church. This is what the Lord Jesus described here in this passage. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his work. Let me say there are two definitions for church. In the Word of God. There is the local assembly, uh, like this one here, uh, or any other local church or congregation that meets in a certain locale. And then there is what we call the universal church, which is made up of all believers around the world collectively, regardless of culture, race, language, and so forth. If they have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ to be their Savior, and in Him alone, they are part of the church of, the, of Jesus Christ. They are part of the bride of Christ. They are part of the, um, um, well, the bride of Christ, the, the, the uh, church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so forth. Um, and it is that universal church that uh, I want to focus most of our attention on today. Let me say this. Uh, as we, right off the bat, people watching on the internet uh, haven't tuned off yet. Hopefully they haven't. But um, the Lord Jesus Christ did not establish an internet church. Nor did he establish a television church or a radio church. 
Now, we have a lot of people who watch our videos, and, and we're grateful for it. And we pray that they're a blessing. We pray that they're instructive to those who watch. And I've had people contact me over the last two years looking for a church near where they live. We have a list of some Bible-believing churches in certain parts of the country and the world. But uh, and the, the list could probably be uh, more greatly expanded uh, than the ones we have listed on there. But some people have no local church near where they live that believes the Word of God from cover to cover. And they have nobody to have fellowship with that, that identifies with the King James Bible and so forth. So in cases like that, all I can say is, uh, I'm sorry. You have to do the best you can and pray that God will raise up somebody uh, who's qualified and, and capable of helping you to discern and learn the Word of God. But uh, the Lord Jesus established a church made up of human uh, flesh and blood people. Uh, a TV preacher is, my dad used to say this back in the 80s before the internet became such a big thing. A TV preacher is not going to shake your hand. They can't hug you when you need comfort. They're not going to visit you when you're sick in the hospital and you would like a pastor to come and visit you. So I'm not discounting those who get a blessing from our ministry, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. I'm, I'm humbled that people watch my sermons each week and watch Pastor Gene Ha's sermons and Pastor Kim's sermons. But the Lord Jesus established a church made up of people. The ministry is people. It's one Christian ministering to another, um, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. And you can't do that from long distance. So uh, I'm sorry if people don't have a church close to them, and there's, we're limited in what we can do about it. But um, I will say this. I've had Pentecostal friends over my lifetime. I had no other, but nobody else that I worked with who knew the Lord Jesus, nobody else was saved. Um, and this one guy, he was a Pentecostal preacher, one job, and um, he loved the Lord Jesus. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt he, he trusted the Bible. He had some wrong doctrines and some wrong opinions, but he was the only guy I had any kind of opportunity to have fellowship with. And if you can't, if you refuse to have fellowship with someone like that, and there's nobody else around, you're cheating yourself. You lack grace as a Christian. So you find fellowship, limited fellowship maybe, wherever you can find it. And um, trust God. Now listen, if you're a King James Bible-believing Christian, you know that that book is um, the Word of God from cover to cover. You don't need to doubt anything in it. Then it should be an easy matter for you to correct the other person's false interpretations when they're quoting some other version of the Bible. Because all you have to do is compare theirs with yours and see how superior the doctrine of the, the uh, King James Bible is compared to some of the sloppiness of their versions. And it doesn't take very long before they start to get their eyes open. And maybe you can bring them to a greater understanding of the Bible. But let me say that from the very get-go. The Lord Jesus established a church made up of people uh, ministering to other people. But let me first consider point number one. The foundation of the church. Jesus said in our text, upon this rock, verse 18, and this is where it begins. You know, the name Peter means rock. And so the Catholic Church has maintained for at least 1,600 years that it was Peter himself upon which Christ was going to build his church. Um, here they claim Jesus made Simon Peter the first pope, effectively, and he gave him authority over the, the affairs of his church, made him the preeminent bishop of all Christians after that time. Uh, his words would eventually come to be uh, equated with the divine words directly from God. This is the esteem uh, many Catholics give to the Pope. And of course, that's the official position of Catholic doctrine. Not all Catholics subscribe to it. But... Uh, that's nevertheless their position. And the entire structure of the Roman Catholic Church, from the popes down to the cardinals and the, the synod of bishops um, and uh, parish priests throughout the world, monks and nuns in, in a monastic life, down to uh, church deacons and the laity down the bottom, this descending order, 
it all, that all, the entire structure comes from this passage here, uh, seven little words, thou art Peter, and upon this rock. A Bible believer doesn't have to go very far to discern the real truth of the matter. Go back uh, in the book of Matthew to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, and uh, let's read verses 24 through 29. Theresoever, excuse me, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. When the Lord Jesus asked his disciples if they would forsake him, it was Simon Peter who said in John chapter 6, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter was humble enough and honest enough to recognize that and admit that. It was the truth of Peter's confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was the rock on which the church would be founded. The Church of Jesus Christ is founded upon Jesus Christ. Uh, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is uh, Jesus Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. Moses said, I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his word is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right, is he Deuteronomy 32 verses 3 and 4 King David wrote the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer Psalm 18 verse 2 let me ask you a question in the New Testament isn't Jesus Christ God manifest in the flesh 1st Timothy 3 16 wasn't he also without sin and without iniquity Simon Peter said he was the just, dying for the unjust, 1 Peter 3, 18. Peter also says, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. This transfer of faith in the invisible God to the visible Son of God is actually hinted at in our in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. And did all drink of that spiritual drink, uh, for they, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That rock out of which the water came when Moses uh, spoke to it and struck it um, was a picture, it was a foreshadow of the Lord Jesus Christ, out of whom eternal life would flow. And it's Peter himself who calls Christ a living stone and the chief cornerstone of God's work. 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 7. You can read that sometime. The Apostle Peter was not the rock or the foundation of Christ's church. Christ is the rock. Christ is the foundation of Christ's church. Uh, there's not a single verse in either testament that says Jesus was going to give Simon Peter authority over his church and his successors by association. Not even this verse that we just read, Matthew 16, 18. All we have is one church's private interpretation of that verse and their insistence that it must be so. Peter says, uh, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, 2 Peter 1, verse 20. Now, since this is a subject that's still debated to this day, between Catholics and Protestants, we have to conclude that if the Lord Jesus 
was making Simon Peter the first pope, he didn't exactly say so, did he? And one of the arguments that's put forth to justify Peter being the authority or the head of Christ's church is that his answer, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, indicated that he was more spiritual. He was more in tune with the, with the revelation of God than the other disciples at that moment. Jesus said, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. But that's to exclude others who also made the same confession. If you just take that one isolated confession of Peter and ignore others who said the same thing, then you can put a private interpretation on it, but a Bible believer doesn't do that. A Bible believer says, what about these others who said the same thing? I'll run through a list of them. There was Simeon in the temple at Jesus' dedication, Luke chapter 2. And it was revealed by the Holy Ghost uh, that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And then he says, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Secondly, there was Andrew, Peter's brother. He's the one that brought Peter to Christ. In John chapter 1, verse 41, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Thirdly, there was a Samaritan woman at the well, John chapter 4. She went back to her townsfolk after speaking to Jesus, and she said, uh, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? She was convinced of it. She was fully persuaded. The modern versions uh, water that down and say, Could this be the Christ? Some of the modern versions go so far as to say, This isn't the Christ, is it? What a bunch of Bible perversion. Fourthly, there were the town folks that she went and talked to. They also met, met him, John 4, verse 42. Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Son, or rather, the Savior of the world. Fifth, unclean spirits recognized it, Luke 4, verse 41. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Who revealed it unto them? Maybe they should be the Pope. And I imagine there are some people who think that they are. Six, there are people who, the people who witnessed Christ's ministry. John 7, verses 31 and 41, respectively. When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than this man, than those which this man hath done? And they also said in verse 41, others said, this is the Christ. Seventh, there is the lunatic man living among the graveyard, remember, naked, cutting himself, and so forth. Mark chapter 5, verse 7. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? Who revealed it unto him? And 8, all the apostles recognized it. John 6, verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. Martha at the death of her brother Lazarus, John 11, verse 27. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And with the rest of the scriptures um, running contrary to the Roman Catholic Church's interpretation, we have to conclude that the Lord Jesus didn't put Simon Peter in charge of his church. One is simple Bible theology. The other is mythology. The rock and the foundation of Christ's church is a saving faith in Jesus Christ himself. That's the foundation of the church. And anyone who uh, trusts in the Lord Jesus alone, apart from anything they can do or any, any organization they can join, that person uh, has trusted the only thing that can save them. That is the person of the Lord Jesus himself. Secondly, Let's consider the formation of the church. And I'm going to have to move along for time's sake. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. If it's his church, it's up to him to see that it is formed correctly. Christ said, 
And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, verse 32. The Bible says the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 2, 47. The Apostle Paul uh, described Christ's exaltation into glory. And he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Then he says, he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's another name for the church, the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, verses 8 through 12. Paul also writes, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, uh, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. There was no more unlikely person to become a minister and a preacher of the Lord Jesus Christ than the Apostle Paul, and he confesses as much in his testimonies. Uh, but the Bible says, Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? You and I can't tell God how to do things. We can't correct God. We can't give God any advice. And God doesn't need our opinions. He needs our loyalty. He needs our trust. He needs our faith. He needs our dedication and our willingness to serve him. Um, the Bible says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. There are three distinct groups in the world right now. There are unsaved Jews, there are unsaved Gentiles, and then there are uh, saved Jews and Gentiles together. They make up the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. They make up the church. Uh, and there is no distinction in the body of Jesus Christ. Every man, woman, boy or girl, young, old, regardless of language, regardless of culture, regardless of family history, regardless of skin color, regardless of any other consideration, if they have trusted in Christ alone as the Savior of their soul and trusted in His blood to be the, the agent by faith which can wash away their sin, they are saved and they're part of the body of Christ. Um, he forgives them. He washes them clean from their sin. He writes their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He sends the Holy Spirit to dwell within their body. And he leads and directs men and women how to serve him, how they can be a, a blessing to the world in his name. Who will be the pastors? Who will be the teachers? Who will be someone with great musical talent that can bless others? Who is um, qualified to do nothing more than to pray? You know, there are a lot of people who are infirm or they're aged, they're afflicted, they, they can't get out of the house much. But I've known of them. They love the Lord, and they, they regularly pray for the church. They regularly pray for their Christian brethren. They pray for the gospel to go out, and they're praying that, that souls will receive the gospel and be moved upon to trust Christ as their Savior. But in the end, Christ is not only the foundation of this, His church. He has to be in charge of its formation as well. Thirdly, consider the fellowship of the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church, he says. I preached a sermon to you once called The Basis of Our Fellowship, and it primarily, primarily concerned the local church and the local congregation. But in the universal church, the, the, the worldwide body of Christ, uh, the fellowship between any two believers has to begin and center around Jesus Christ. Uh, there's no reason in the world, Pastor Kim and I, should have been drawn together and become friends with one another, except that we were trusting in the same shed blood of the Lord Jesus, first of all. And then secondly, we were convinced that, that one Bible was sufficient to be the Word of God. And our church is unique. We, we believe we have the perfect Word of God in two languages. That makes us very unique. But um, no two people, no two groups... Uh, are going to be exactly alike. Uh, it's Jesus Christ who unites them, however. He unites me with you, you with me. Uh, long before there were any denominations in Christianity, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Long before there were Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians bickering with one another, the Bible said, neither is there salvation in any other, 
for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4, verse 12. Long before there were Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox bickering about, by the way, about a thousand years ago, uh, those two churches split off from each other. So you have the church in the East, the Greek or the Russian patriarch, the Greek patriarchs uh, and their religious practices, and the Western church headed by the Catholic Pope. About a thousand years ago, they, they splintered one from the other and broke off for a couple of dumb things just as stupid as this. Should we make the sign of the cross with just one finger on our forehead, or should we put three fingers together signifying the Trinity and do it that way? Those are the things they argued about. Things such as that which caused them to split. Which all it means is neither, one, neither group was saved. They're arguing about things that are completely irrelevant. But um, before those two groups came along, the Bible said that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 1, 2, 5. Long before there were any modern cults and uh, schisms and uh, charismatics and new age and believers and so forth, the Bible declared, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, 1 John 5, 12. You can have all the religion in the world and not have anything real. You need Jesus Christ. And the possibility of fellowship must begin with him. It's his church. Now, let me move on here. Point number four, the function of the church. Consider the function of the church. Verse 19 in our text, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And in this verse, uh, Catholic popes have maintained that it's their right to decide who goes to heaven and who, who doesn't. Here are these jokes. There have been a thousand jokes about St. Peter at the pearly gates deciding who's going to get in and who's not going to get in. But um, over in Matthew 18, verse 18, the Lord Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. Ye is plural. So he gave that authority to all the apostles. It wasn't given just to Simon Peter. And in the context there, Matthew 18, the context was the forgiveness of sin. Um, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee uh, one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he, shall not, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Part of the function of the church uh, included the, the, the authority to discipline or to separate yourselves from someone who is a troublemaker. Somebody who was causing division and schism and um, speaking against the Word of God and the word revelation of God. Uh, and this is believer disciplining another believer. He said, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. And you can see how this is easily transferable into the local church, the local assembly. How does it apply to the body of Jesus Christ, the universal church, binding and loosing and so forth? Well, first of all, Matthew records... Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Matthew 28, 19. And the Lord commanded, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. The things that bring about salvation, uh, rather the thing, is when the believer, he, someone believes what he is taught about the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection on behalf of the sinner. He was God manifest in the flesh. He had no sins of his own, but was dying for the sake of the sinner's guilt. His perfection, his righteousness is then transferred to the sinner who repents by faith. And he's able to forgive the sinner um, of, of his offenses toward God. And he cleanses him from all guilt. I'm so glad that I was saved when I was a little boy. And at that moment, cleansed from all guilt. I don't remember praying anything else except the two words, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Because it was on my mind. I, I knew I was guilty for sin, as little as I knew at six years old. 
Paul says that God hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, and that you and I are ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20. As though God did beseech you by us, he's using you and I as his agents to reach the lost, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. When you are instrumental in bringing somebody else to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting him alone for the forgiveness of their sins and their eternal life, you are, in effect, loosing them from the consequence of their sin. You are binding them to the Lord Jesus Christ. God uses you as an ambassador, as a representative, as his minister. And that, and that takes place uh, no matter where you're living, which country you're living, what language you're speaking, no matter what color of your skin, no matter what your, your ethnicity or any other consideration, that takes place when our missionaries are reaching souls for Christ in other languages around the world. It doesn't matter. It's not limited to the United States. It's not some religion limited to the United States. It sort of sprang out of, you know, the First Amendment, the religious freedom like Mormonism and JWs and Seventh-day Adventists, other cults that latched onto that part of the U.S. Constitution and perverted it and twisted it away from its, in, its uh, first meaning. But the Bible says, For we are laborers together with God, yea, uh, are God's, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9 says. Paul wrote, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. The Bible says, Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. 1 Chronicles 16, verse 24. We make known that he is the foundation of the church. He is responsible for its formation. He provides the, provides the fellowship of the members of his church. And he gives us instruction as to its function. And lastly, and like I said, I'm going to move along for time's sake. Consider the future of the church, the future of the church. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Your eternal future is secure if you are part of his church. If you're not, you have no idea what's going to happen to you. You don't know where you're going, and judgment is waiting for you, my friend. There is nothing within the power of, of Satan or hell that can destroy your salvation if you're trusting in Jesus Christ alone. Um, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. The Bible says God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, verse 8. Paul writes, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul says that God hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 6. If you're in his church, and that only happens by the new birth, if you're in his church, God considers you to be elevated into heaven with him right now. You and I are just simply waiting for these bodies of flesh and blood to be changed, to be made incorruptible, immortal, and glorified like his glorified body. I can't wait for that to happen. Now, the Bible says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and if you're in his church, he does, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Romans 8 verse 11. Paul says, are we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit, or that is, the redemption of our body. Romans 8, verse 23. He writes, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. The saints from the church of Jesus Christ are described as returning with him in glorified power, uh, Revelation 19, verse 11, as an army from heaven. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. The Bible says, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war, Revelation 19, 11. You and I come with him. That's part of the future of the church. So and then one thing we, we often overlook. If, um, and let me 
try to wind this down for time's sake. If you and I don't come back in glorified form with the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Bible says we will, then the gates of hell have effectively prevailed against his church because that's part of your future as the church of Jesus Christ, to come back with him in invincible, incorruptible, indestructible, supernatural form that will never be destroyed. It can never be harmed. Read Joel chapter 2, the first 11 verses sometime. Make a point to read Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and see the description of that army which comes back. It says when they, um, are, no sword will be able to injure them, right. and, uh, and so forth. You'll be indestructible. The world's right now, uh, the secular world's obsessed with, you know, superheroes and DC comics and Marvel and all that. And all of that, a lot of that's just, you know, mythology and fiction about some guy with technological gadgets who is, enables him to, you know, thwart the plans of the bad guys and so forth. But you won't need any technological gadget. When the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, he didn't need a space suit. He didn't mean that need a space shuttle. Neither will you. To, tra to traverse the, the universe and the galaxies and every solar system that you desire. But um, that's part of the future of the church. And I'm going to bring this to a close. We're going to close right here for time's sake. But what a wonderful thing to be part of an organization like the church. It's not a physical organization run from the top down, management top down like an earthly uh, corporation. It is a spiritual organism of all believers united to the Lord Jesus Christ.